Becoming Human, a Social Task, The Threefold Social Order, by Carl Koenig, edited by Richard Steele, translated by Carlotta Dyson. The third of three lectures given at Furenbuehl at Michaelmas, Temple Building and Community Building, Goetheanism and the Goetheanum. The third lecture given at Foreign Buell on Tuesday, September 29th, 1964. Dear friends, yesterday evening, on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of the last address, which Rudolf Steiner gave on September 28th, 1924, we came to the insight that architecture the style, form, and metamorphosis of buildings is closely and intimately connected with what is built up in the social realm, in short, with what can be described as community building. This is something extremely important, and it is highlighted by the loss of the first Goetheanum. We were able to call in mind how the moment the outer building went up in flames, when the beauty and grandeur of this mighty work of architecture had perished, Rudolf Steiner issued a call for a new direction. What was to be rebuilt, what had perished outwardly as wood, concrete, and glass, in a new way so that a new society an anthroposophical society with new aims could come about. There is an intimate connection between these two events, the burning of the Gertianum and the formation of the general anthroposophical society through the Christmas Foundation meeting in 1923. They are as intimately connected as building in stone and building in the social realm has ever been in history. I referred earlier to the existence of the Mason guilds. Here the initiated carried out the building works so that the uninitiated were able to gather together in common work, in common activity, in building a community, whether through building a temple, an arena, a church or a mosque. This is something we must never lose sight of, particularly during the course of our work this winter, where we have planned to study the various forms in which communities come about, the formation of social groups who want to work and be active together. Now another aspect needs to be added, which is peculiar to our time. I referred to it yesterday and would like to do so again today in such a way as to allow Rudolf Steiner's words to resound. We described yesterday how after the burning of the Gertianum, Rudolf Steiner wove the light-filled Michaelmas activity into the building of social communities. The Gertianum was destroyed. He made clear to us that a new consciousness had to arise for a celebration of Michael festivals, because it is only through the celebration of such Michael festivals that true community building can arise. I will now quote Rudolf Steiner. When, however, the festivals, which today are celebrated without understanding, will again be understood, we will also have the strength out of a spiritual understanding of the course of the year to establish a festival which will only begin to have true significance for present-day humanity. This will be the Michael festival in the last days of September, when autumn approaches, the leaves wither, the trees grow bare, and nature approaches death. Just as it approaches the budding of new life, at Easter, when just in the dying down of nature we experience how the soul of the earth 
is uniting with the earth, bringing with it Michael out of the clouds. When we acquire the strength to establish such a festival out of the spirit, a festival that brings a feeling of fellowship into our social life once more, then we shall have founded something in our midst which has its source in the spirit. For the moment it would be far more important than all other social reflections, which will only be fruitful in the present confused conditions if imbued with spirit. If a number of people with spiritual understanding were to come together for the purpose of instituting on the earth out of cosmic forces something like a Michael festival, an autumn festival which would be a worthy counterpart to the Easter festival. If something could be resolved upon, for which the motifs could be found in the spiritual world, and which would create a feeling of fellowship among human beings out of the fullness and freshness of the human heart, this then would be something which could create a social bond among people. End of quote. This is the important thing, dear friends, for this is what was engendered through the architecture, the form of the Gertianum. It can only be reborn in the social realm if right and true Michael festivals are celebrated more and more by human communities. These considerations, however, have further implications that it is not only the building activity as such which is connected with the social realm, but that with and within these buildings, festivals are celebrated. Festival moments in the course of the year are held in such a way that they can be inscribed in human souls so that those celebrating together may form a union, an order, a community. One of the many reasons why contemporary social life is in such a state of decline is that we have lost the commitment to the celebration of festivals in our time. People nowadays actually feel embarrassed at the prospect of celebrating festivals together. With these words of introduction, I wanted to round off what I said yesterday. If we want to take things further, we would now need to look at something else. Let us ask how this Gertianum was built. In the background, we have our social awareness of the connection between building and social structures. The connection between social structures and the celebration of festivals within and around the architectural work so that a social form may arise from it. If we now look back, and in these weeks and months, it is just 50 years since the First World War cast its dreadful shadow across mankind. We are bound to see clearly how the Gertianum arose on an outwardly peaceful island amid the storms of this First World War. This, too, is an important image for the history of our century. The fact that on an enclave on the Dornach Hill near Basel, a group of people comprising representatives of all those nations at war with each other were erecting a building together. They were erecting a building from which, after it was finished, a very specific spiritual task was to emanate. At that time, between 1914 and 1919, something very special was coming into being. Looked at superficially, one might say that it developed in parallel with the coming about of the Gertianum. If one were to look a little deeper, one would have to say that it arose in the most inter, in the most intimate interrelationship with the development of this building. 
I shall try to describe it briefly. In 1916 and 1917, two basic works by Rudolf Steiner were published, which are still very little known, which have not yet even been translated into English, because they have not been taken as seriously as they should have been. The Riddle of Man was published in 1916, and Riddles of the Soul in 1917. The titles indicate that the author wanted these books to be seen as connected. In The Riddle of Man, Rudolf Steiner looks back to the 19th century, trying to discern threads of true spirituality within the cultural life of that time. He wrote about the three great philosophers, Fichte, Hegel, and Schelling, describing them as representing a kind of twilight of the entire spiritual life of Europe, yet also containing the seeds of a new light of the spirit. He went on to describe the extremely significant turning points to be found in the work of a philosopher such as Immanuel Hermann Fichte, son of Johann, of Johann Gottlieb Fichte, who, within the framework of his intellectual, yet all-encompassing consciousness, described, almost as a premonition, the entire content of anthroposophy, which was to come in the future. He even used the word anthroposophy, referring to the new spiritualized understanding of man, of which he has a premonition without as yet being able to describe it clearly. Rudolf Steiner then turns his attention to people like Carl Christian Planck and Wilhelm Heinrich Proust as personalities who have a first dim and semi-conscious perception of reincarnation and karma. He also mentions that within Austrian cultural life, there were poets represented spirituality. This is the content of the book, The Riddle of Man. And reading it again and again, one becomes aware how threads are picked up here, which should have formed a bridge to what was to be revealed at the beginning of the Age of Light as spiritual science. The other book, published a year later, is called Riddles of the Soul. Here, a different note is sounded. There is no longer looking to the past, but to the future. The book starts on a dissonant note, with a hard and sharp analysis of the work of one of the contemporary psychologists and philosophers, Max de Soie, which Rudolf Steiner dismisses. Then follows an appreciation of the recently deceased psychologist and philosopher, Franz Brentano, about whom indeed an enormous amount could be said as one of the precursors of an anthroposophical psychology. Following on this, Rudolf Steiner sketches a new science of man. He himself calls it an outline presentation. Here the twelve senses are described, the threefold nature of the soul, the threefold structure of the human physical organization is referred to for the first time. The unitary structure of the nervous system, not as a motor sensory, but, but solely as a sensory apparatus is referred to. The nature of the human being is studied here from many other points of view. What does all this signify? In Riddles of the Soul, the foundation is laid for a Michaelic spiritual science. And the foundation of the Michaelic spiritual science, this Michaelic science of man, are the essentials prerequisites for the idea that also develops during this time the idea of the threefold structure of the social organism. All this needs to be seen in its context, 
It needs to be seen in the context of the Gertianum, which was in the process of being built and shaped. The Gertianum, which was intended to be the home of a new Michaelic science of man, a Michaelic natural science. Around the Gertianum, once completed, something else would have developed, namely the seed of a social organism that would have radiated into the surrounding peoples of Europe. If we are aware of this, then we can glimpse the divine thoughts connected with the building of the Gertianum. Here a building was to be constructed. Within this building, natural science and the entire materialistic knowledge of the time was to be permeated with spiritual knowledge in a Michaelic way. From there, messengers were to carry order, social order, into the decaying social organism of the time. This decaying social organism had been shaken by the killing of millions in the First World War, had been shaken by the collapse of the moral qualities of the past, had been shaken by the collapse of knowledge of the spirit. These had been the intentions behind the building of the Gertianum. This should have been a new start, and that would have been possible to some extent, as no clairvoyance is needed for a renewal of a Michaelic natural science. What is required is purely and simply spiritual cognition. Soon after the Christmas Foundation meeting on January 13, 1924, Rudolf Steiner tried to describe in a lecture how spirit cognition became possible in the course of time. At the beginning of this lecture, he points out that the time in which we live is a very special one with regard to cognitive possibilities. In earlier times, the initiates were able to look at the created world, at creation. In doing so, they encountered the active spirit of the creative formative powers. He described how, for example, the initiates of the old Persian epoch were able to look at the forms of the earth and how in these forms, be the animal or plant forms, stones or minerals, how in these surface phenomena on the earth they met spirit activity in the form of spiritual images. Later in the Egyptian period, the initiate looked upon everything constituted the watery element. How in the Greek epoch, spirit vision manifests itself to the element of air, like a fata morgana. How eventually, at the inception of the European age, the beginning of the Middle Ages, the last of the initiated, for instance, individual Rosicrucians, endeavored to experience the mirroring of the spirit within the element of warmth. However, as the warmth element no longer permitted this experience, Rosicrucians had to employ ox ancillary means by studying the earthly world, by taking the knowledge into themselves. Individuals such as Faust, Paracelsus, and others come to mind. And then taking this knowledge into sleep, carrying it upwards as knowledge and waiting for the answer from the spiritual world. What they were permitted to know and what was necessary for them to know would be revealed to them in the form of pictorial symbols. Rudolf Steiner continues by pointing out that in our time it is no longer necessary to carry this knowledge into sleep, but that by means of particular effort, effort of thinking, it is possible to gain answers in waking consciousness. What one needs to do and this he calls true spiritual science, is to study modern natural science, 
taking it into oneself and offering it to Michael, who will then give back to us this earthly knowledge transformed into spiritual knowledge. Rudolf Steiner is here quoted. This possibility still exists today. If you have been touched by the Rosicrucian principle of initiation, you may today study Heckel's theories and all its materialism, having first permeated yourself with the cognitive methods outlined in Knowledge of Higher Worlds. Study everything you can learn about the human ancestors from Heckel's The Evolution of Man, even if it seems repugnant to you. Study it in this repugnant form. Learn everything you can learn about it from external natural science, and then offer it up to the gods. You will gain everything that is written about, everything that is written about evolution in my book, Occult Science. You will see this is the connection between the feeble, weak knowledge which the human being can acquire through his physical body here on earth and the knowledge the gods can give him on the basis of such study, given the appropriate outlook and presentation. Man has to offer up to the gods what here can be learned on the earth because times have actually changed. End of quote. This is what should have taken place within the Gertianum and wherever the ideals of the Gertianum were active. Then a comprehensive Michaelic science of man would have been developed. The Michaelic messengers would have gone out from the Gertianum in order to make the threefold social order a reality. The destruction of the Gertianum by fire was the most terrible historical disaster, as it wiped out the center of this activity. What was then meant to take place as a social organism has only been partially effective. Yesterday, I read the passage in which Rudolf Steiner said that no other building would really be able to replace this first Gertianum. We have experienced the reality of this, but now we have to take the next step. We are still developing our understanding of the connection between architectural building and social building. Let us look back for a moment to that castle, the Karlstein, in which we could experience an intimation of the image of the threefold social organism. Let us now look upon the Karlstein Castle, built in the 14th century, and to the Gertianum, which arose in the 20th century. What does it wish to express? Is it, too, an image of the whole social organism? What is it? We are allowed to ask this. It is not unjustified to ask such questions. What was it intended? To represent. This Gertianum was intended to be a building of the spiritual life, of that free spiritual life which is part of the threefold social organism. The spiritual life was to have been found its realization in the Gertianum building. In a lecture, Rudolf Steiner In a lecture which Rudolf Steiner called Esoteric Prelude to an Exoteric Treatise on the Social Question, he spoke about the background, the esoteric background of the three spheres of social life. He describes the spiritual life as follows. He says, Everything that gives the human head its configuration its form, points to life before birth, points to what the human being brings with him through birth and this physical life from the physical world. I'll start again. 
everything that gives the human head its configuration, its form, points to life before birth, points to what the human being brings with him through birth into the physical life from the spiritual world, either from the spiritual world itself or from a previous incarnation on earth. Being aware of the connection between all individual capacities of the human being, be they manual or mental, with the formation of the human head, our perception is carried further so that we are able to recognize that everything based on human capacities can be traced back to the life before birth. You can see what it is that leads the spiritual scientists to such a significant illumination of the nature of spiritual life in the physical world. Physical spiritual life, my dear friends, exists here in the physical world because as human beings we bring something with us through birth. All spiritual life in the physical world in the sense that I have spoken about today, does not simply arise out of this physical world. It arises from those impulse that we carry from the spiritual world into the physical existence through birth. We shape this physical spiritual life in human society here on earth because we are human beings who bring into physical existence resonances of a supersensible existence. There would be no art, there would be no science, there would be no educational impulses. We would not be able to educate the children. We would not be able to give schooling if we did not bring impulses from life before birth into physical life. This is one aspect. End of quote. This has to do with the human head, and the fact that we carry a head on our shoulders guarantees the knowledge that we emanate from prenatal existence, that we originate from a pre birth existence, which is much more real than the sense world in which we now find ourselves. It is the guarantee of our spiritual life. Yesterday, I was able to describe to you what is today underpinned by these words of Rudolf Steiner. The actual realm of the spiritual life is that in which the dead and the yet unborn weave and work. This is the origin of the intentions and the shape of the Gertianum as an image, an artistic metamorphosis of this human head. Picture to yourselves once more the ground plan with its large and small hall, each covered by a cupola, the windows, the Christ statue, the pulpit, and the pillars, twelve in the small cupola and seven on each side of the large one. This, in fact, represents none other than the shape of our head. The small cupola is the forehead, and the large one is the back of the head, the occiput. The windows are like the senses. All this is the architecture, the cosmic architecture that we all carry as effigy of the spiritual activity that took place before birth and that the statue of Christ would have stood at the back of the small cupola can only be understood if we remember that in the past centuries an entirely new organ has been formed within the human frontal bone, that is, the part of the skull from the forehead to the roots of the nasal cavity. An entirely new organ through the activity of high spiritual beings in that organ, spiritual cognition, the beholding of Christ in our time, can be born. 
This is the ground plan of the building of which mankind has been deprived. Mankind has been deprived of a center of active spiritual life. This means that the new morality for the sphere of law could not come about as intended and thus could not influence the economic life accordingly. This has resulted in the ongoing catastrophe in which we are forced to live today and from which there is almost no way out. What has actually happened? The economy has gone crazy. Constantly increasing production across the whole world without true purpose or direction. This has led to an explosive rise in the number of consumers, that is, in the world population. Production is not increasing because the population is rising, but rather it is the case more and more that consumers need to be born because production has increased so much. What is resulting from this can only be described as a severe asthmatic condition in economic life. Excessive production is like breathing in and breathing in and more breathing in while the breathing out process is missing. What is it that is being prevented? It is the possibility for human beings to die. Old people are prevented from returning to the spiritual world. They are artificially maintained here on earth as living corpses. This is the result of all the things I have tried to describe to you. Now it is not necessary to say more about it today. But following on from what I have tried to show you, another question can be posed, and that is the following. Have you ever really asked yourself in which style the first Gertianum was built? Does it stand completely alone within our time, in a vacuum, as it were? Or is it a phenomena of the times, which appears to be the case after everything I have tried to say? say, where does it belong? You will agree that it is an incredibly fascinating thing to contemplate the various changing architectural styles against the background of the connection between architecture and social form. Looking back, we realize that in the 19th century, there was no distinctive architectural style. There was a kind of eclecticism. If you walk around the Ringstrasse in Vienna, you will experience this very clearly. Here Greek, Neo-Gothic, and Gothic styles have been copied more or less successfully. If it were not permeated with childhood memories, I would have to call it a kind of confectionery style. You will find the same thing in Berlin, Paris, Munich, and all these cities that have been built during the 19th century. Going back further, we come to the Rococo, the Baroque. Before the Baroque was the Classic style and the High Gothic. Before the High Gothic, the Gothic style proper, and earlier, the Romanesque or Norman, the Basilicas, and before the basilicas, everything comprising the primitive Christian art of the catacombs, roofed over by the architecture of the Romans with its baths and theaters, circuses and palaces, and finally, the Greek temple. We could go back even further, but that's not necessary at the moment. We should not only look at this but try to experience it inwardly. How different is a Greek temple from a Roman bath or a Roman palace? How different from the very early Christian buildings, the basilicas, the Romanesque style, forever developing further, metamorphosing, forming? 
All this is accompanied by a transformation in facial expression, gestures, clothing, shoes, thinking, speech, actions, activities. Everything is in a permanent process of transformation. It is a continuing process of cultural metamorphosis, bringing forth corresponding social forms from the city-states of Greece to the Roman Caesars, to the disintegration of all social forms and their reconstruction in monarchy, empire, and papacy. If we really picture this vividly, we will realize at the end of the 19th and at the beginning of the new 20th century, a new architecture as well as social style is trying to emerge. A style which we can survey in its entirety only now that we have gained some distance from it. It is a style that expresses itself in a similar manner in music, art, drama, poetry, and painting. A style which with a slight note of disdain we now called Jugendstil or Art Nouveau. If we try to identify the people through which this style came to expression, we notice that all of them were contemporaries of Rudolf Steiner. They were all born in the middle or the beginning of the 1860s, be it Gustav Mahler or Henry von der Felde, Gerhard Hauptmann, Eugenie de la Gracia, Emil Nolde or Edvard Munch, or Aristide Melo. In all of them, we find this quality of an emergent art nouveau, which then was not really further developed. Everybody took a bit of it, and it became splintered, sexualized, intellectualized, and eventually artists such as Gustav Klimt and Egon Schäler came. And they turned what was really trying to emerge into a kind of mannerism. It is interesting to ask oneself where the origins of this art nouveau actually lie. When we ask this question, we are led back to a particular phase that arose around the 1860s or the 1850s in England among the pre-Raphaelites. A certain impetus arose, which lived there, for example, in a man like William Morris, who had a quite specific intention. He did not merely want to paint a picture or build a house, but his aim was to elevate the entire human lifestyle right down to clothing, interior design, and furniture. All these items were meant to embody something new and creative, through which man could become truly human. But this too was extinguished. It would swept aside through the emergence of the various isms, expressionism, cubism, and whatever else. However wonderful the individual ideals, such as the Blue Rider or the Bauhaus, however wonderful these were in themselves, the essence of the art Nouveau was lost, with one exception, and that was the Gertianum, and everything there began to develop around it as a new Gertianistic style. Here we have the elevation, the first true spiritualization of Art Nouveau. After the horrors of modern art and the disintegration of all form, this will have to be the starting point for future developments in art. However, this will only be possible after the inevitable ultimate disintegration. Rudolf Steiner indicated precisely the time in which new Gertianums would arise all over Europe in the 70s of the coming century. If we now look back again to all these changes in style, and ask ourselves, from the point of view of spiritual science, 
who is behind these changes, we can come to the realization that they are brought about by those ruling spirits who take over the guidance of mankind every 300 years. In 1879, Michael took over the rulership and many of his servants preceding him, preparing for his regency and beginning to develop his style that reached an initial flowering in the Gertianum. A similar thing took place with his predecessor, Gabriel, during whose rulership the Baroque and Rococo styles developed, and before that the Gothic, the High Gothic. It would be possible to trace these developments in detail according to the various centuries. But what developed at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century was crowned by the Gertianum. In the Gertianum, the style we may call Art Nouveau or Jungenstil reached an initial stage of perfection. Herein we should recognize the activity of Michael. Beyond all the chaos, Beyond all the decay, beyond everything that falls away, Michael stands within and above mankind radiantly, as described in the Michael meditation. We can unite ourselves with his being by turning to the description that Rudolf Steiner gave of him, by living deeply into this description. Then from this description, we stand forth with the true picture of the one who is the master builder of our time. Quote, Michael is a be being who actually reveals nothing unless we offer up to him something we have developed ourselves here on earth through our diligent spiritual work. Michael is a silent spirit. Michael is a taciturn spirit. While the other ruling archangels are talkative spirits, in a spiritual sense, of course, Michael is altogether withdrawn, a spirit who speaks little, giving at most sparse indications. For what we learn from Michael is not really the word but if I may put it in that way, the gaze, the power of his gaze. This is based on the fact that Michael really occupies himself most of all with what human beings create out of the spirit. He lives with the consequences of human actions. The other spirits live more with the causes. Michael lives more with the consequences. The other spirits kindle in man the impulses for what he shall do. Michael will be the true spiritual hero of freedom. He allows human beings to act, and then he receives what becomes of human deeds in order to take it further on in the cosmos, in order to effect through them in the cosmos what human beings were not yet able to effect. End of quote. This is the image of this being. But through the fact that this being waits, and sometimes in the descriptions of Rudolf Steiner, interrupts the waiting by beckoning to human beings with his gentle prompting, prompting them to remember their own spirit nature. Through the fact that this being waits for what we do and not what we are required or impelled to do, the opportunity is vouchsafed for us to develop what is the most fundamental ideal for our time, initiative. The adversary powers are those who want to lift all burdens from human beings so that they would stagger through the day and night, semi-consciously and lost in dreams, 
leading to the decay of social structures all around us. To awaken to initiative, on the other hand, and to form communities out of such initiative, and within these communities to celebrate Michael festivals in order to gain fresh impulses and to carry in us the image of the Gertianum as the image of the new form of community. These are the seeds of hope that may prepare the future. Everything else is irrelevant, merely incidental. For what matters today is wherever possible to celebrate the royal wedding with the worthy and the unworthy so that the tables may be filled where the meal of the spirit community may be celebrated. This is the only way of serving Michael.